Hey, Nick, how you doing today? Doing great, Dave. How are you? Not bad. Not bad at all. Another Friday, another podcast. Here we go. We're getting up there. What is this, 25 now? Uh, 24 or 25. Mm, right. Enough that we've lost count. How yeah, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, interesting investing topic today, and it's based on something we get asked about quite often. Um, and I, I actually wrote this article back in 2019, the one where we're kind of going off of today. So it's a little dated in a way, but uh, but I think still relevant. It'll lead into some more relevant topics. So uh, we're going to talk about um, investing in new industries and new technologies. Yeah, so I'm excited about this one. We've got some uh, good examples of um, what to do and kind of how and why to do it. But also, like you said, as financial planners, people oftentimes make the assumption that we know everything about the stock market. And unfortunately, that's not true. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know about you, Dave, I won't speak for you, but me personally, I follow very, very few individual companies and very, very few industries. Um, so it's always interesting when somebody comes in with an idea of investing in a new industry because chances are I've never heard of it or <laughs> <laughs> if I have, I don't know much about it, but it's still, you know, people, I think in this day and age are intrigued by it because there's stories out there of people making a whole lot of money, um, by making the right, the perfect investment at the perfect time. Right, right. And, and so kind of what, what prompted this, uh, when I first made the notes for this story, um, was back in the fall of 2019, so 18 months or so ago at this point, and uh, you know there was there was all this buzz about Beyond Meat, mm. the company Beyond Meat, and they were creating a meat alternative, and the meat alternative industry was all brand new, and they had done their IPO a little bit before that. I want to say in the spring, but the big deal on that particular day was that they were they were inking a contract with McDonald's. Yeah. And, and so I got a couple of emails from clients that day, like, hey, is this something we should we should put some money into? And it was actually up about 11 percent that day. Mm -hmm. And I kind of fell back on my stock answers of, well, you know, the, the thing I always talk about with this, because I think it, it hits home with people, is that these new industries, it would it would be akin to trying to pick the right computer company to invest in back in the like mid 70s to the early 80s right right and and you know i kind of grew up in that phase that era in the early 80s and i was a bit of a computer geek i know that mm. probably shocks people <laughs> but uh you know one of my first paying gigs was helping teachers in my mom's school put their grades into their apple twos <laughs> when i was in like fifth or sixth grade so so, or figuring out how to do it. And, and so it would be somewhat akin to trying to pick which computer company out of all the guys building computers in their garages in, you know, 1979, which one of those is going to become Apple and Microsoft, right? Right. Well, and it's easy to pick them now because we know them as right. household names. But back yeah. then, that was not the case by any stretch yeah. of the imagination. Yeah. And, and you and I just did some math a few minutes ago. If you had invested in Apple, if you had bought 10 shares of Apple in the IPO, you would have spent $220 yep. in, in 19, early 1981. And you would currently have about $182,000 worth of Apple wow. stock. Wow. Yeah. So, so you, you'd look like a genius, right? Absolutely. But also, you know, there, there's a couple of things to point out there. One is there were plenty of times along the way in the 1980s when Apple was teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And it, you'd have really had to keep the faith to, yeah, to, uh, to hang on to it. And along those lines, the pile of names of companies from the late 70s and early 80s that didn't make it is immense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can go on, you got, you can go on Google or Wiki, Wikipedia actually has a list of defunct uh, United States computer technology companies from the early 80s. And it's kind of interesting. Some of them actually I remember, you know, uh, um, Atari being one of them that was near and sure. dear to my heart as a, as a kid, you know, and, and some of them got bought by other companies and went through mergers. But by and large, you know, not a lot of them look like great investments, really, in hindsight. 
Yeah. So um, to your point, not only do you have to be smart enough to pick the right company, you also have to be stable and, and willing to stick with that company through, you know, what could is, is typically potentially there's tumultuous times. Right. So not only do you need to know how to or what company to identify, but also sticking with them, which I, I personally think is a little bit harder. It's easier to invest in a company than it is to ride them out when things are well or not sell when things are going really well. And you want to, you know, maximize or, or, you know, take your profit. Right. Um, so that's a, a well, interesting dynamic to it that I think a lot of people don't really understand. Yeah. And, and so now, you know, we live in an era where we have watches on our wrists that have as much computing power as the desktops we had, uh, you know, in 1981, 82. It was not. A, so it's hard to remember that in, in that early phase, there was still an active debate about whether people would even want computers. Yeah. You know? and, and I remember my, my uncle was an attorney. And in the mid a couple of years later, it was a big deal when he talked about they were going to get he they were being proactive and going to get uh, computers on the desktops of everybody that worked there. That was a like now you know we don't even we wouldn't even think about an employee not having a computer, right? Right. Yeah. But that was that was you know that was like whoa you know that's kind of a risk <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take right. that step right and, and so you know back to like the beyond meat example you know it, we're still trying to figure out if that's even going to be a thing five years from now and it may right. be and it probably will be but it, you know what's that gonna and what will that mean for the economy and the growth prospects of those companies right and, and you know you you just never know until until these things develop yeah well and, and to your point we're starting to see competition in that market right mm -hmm. so there's beyond meat and impossible and you know a couple of other larger grocery chains are coming up with their own brand um, but also oftentimes the industry disruptor isn't necessarily always the one that goes on to right. be the mammoth company and to um, your, yeah to, to that point, um, the latest news I've seen on Beyond Meat is that McDonald's has decided instead of working with them, they're going to create their own. Right. Yeah. You know, McDonald's isn't exactly an industry disruptor. Right. And they, well, and, and they don't necessarily like paying, you know, normal prices for things anyway. So um, <laughs> that's a whole right. other topic for a whole other day. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I just want to go to back to Apple really quick, too, because, you know, we, we think of it as a no brainer. You know, you invest in Apple. But mm -hmm. do you remember uh, Ronald Wayne at all, Dave? No, I don't remember Ronald, Ronald Wayne. Ronald Wayne was actually one of the three founders of Apple. Okay. And he sold his shares in the very beginning for like $800, <laughs> which would now yeah. be worth like $32 billion. Yeah. Which is, they, they even went on to um, do articles recently where they said he would have been better off taking one of like the prototype apples because it would be worth, you know, <laughs> worth more as so a collection. He'd still, he'd still be a millionaire at least. And so just goes to the point of how hard it is to identify. He was even in there. He knew both Steve Jobs and Wozniak. And Wozniak. Yeah. Exactly exactly what was going on but he just decided you know these guys are too crazy what they're doing pushing the envelope too much it got out um right. and, and so they've actually done interviews with him interestingly enough about you know how how does it feel to make yeah. the biggest investing mistake ever and, and you know one of the things he comes back to is you never know what it's going to be when you're staring at it and you know mm -hmm. or what it could potentially be you have an idea but you never really know and so right. i always found that as, as an interesting one and so um I'll share with you a couple of, of my investment blunders or, or opportunities to get into a new industry, if you will. When I was a senior in college, this would have been 2004, I think, there was a, a lady that came in who worked for one of the broker dealers, actually, and she was telling us about their careers in the industry and, and was talking to, and somebody asked her what stocks she liked. And, and so she actually gave us one that she couldn't tap Tick, 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 excuse me there. Um, she couldn't technically recommend because it was under ten dollars a share, and it was uh, Sirius Radio. Oh so yeah, Sirius, and that was the big thing, right? Yeah. They were changing the world of radio, yeah. and eventually, you know, I think it was like three dollars a share back then, and yeah. it went up to like ten at one point, and I think it's still hovering around that even after the merger. It just never really took mm -hmm. off, and so that's mm -hmm. one of those, you know, everybody thought this is the future. And it wasn't necessarily to be, um, yeah, you know, I, 
streaming and podcasting kind of came in and crushed yeah. it to some degree. I'm glad you brought that up because I remember I was I was working at National City at the time, and I remember people coming in and asking about Sirius Stock. You know, so so th- these conversations have been ongoing for years, right? Right, and and you know, it was one of those that people thought really would have you know mm-hmm. taken off, and it, it oh. didn't. I'm sure there's a lot more of those than there are of apples or you know, amazons or the success stories do you remember do you remember palm i do not palm palm pilots oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. before before uh before uh smartphones were a thing there were pdas personal uh digital assistants palm, i had a palm pilot i loved it but that stuff i think they got bought by 3com eventually but it was okay. pennies on the dollar compared to what they thought the stock was worth a couple times and, yeah, you know, I mean, we always we always come at at this from the standpoint of the the stock price on any given day pretty much tells you everybody's some consensus idea of what that stock is worth, right? right? And you know, when we're talking about big companies, General Electric, Parker and Gamble, you know, the big Fortune 500, there's lots of information, right? Mm-hmm. And so those prices are a pretty accurate reflection of what everybody expects those companies to do. And it's no different with these fledgling companies. That's everybody's, you know, if if Beyond Meat is trading at $100 a share, it's because that's what there's people that think it's worth more than that and they're buying it. And people think it's worth less than that and they're selling it. And always remember for every buyer, there's got to be a seller. Right. And and so the thing is, so the the price is still, you know, that that some consensus is just a lot less information available, mm-hmm. a lot more unknowns. And so that price is going to be more volatile and volatility can be good like Apple and volatility can be bad like Palm or Sirius. Right. And, um, you know, it it's just that until these industries get some legs under them, there's really no no real good way to judge their value and their impact on the economy. And that's what investing is. It's about trying to find value that's going to continue to grow consistently over time. Otherwise it's speculation. Right. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody that keeps it in perspective, you know, separates out um, what they want to do for kind of, like a fun investment or a speculation play versus their investment funds for their retirement. No different than I don't really have a problem with someone that can afford a couple dollars a week buying lottery tickets. Right. But it's, it's, or, or going to the, you know, the casino and, and having a good time with a little bit of their money, but you've got to recognize it for what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that goes to the point of, risk versus reward right the only Mm -hmm. way to you know if you are in order to get that kind of growth like we saw in apple there's got to be a lot of risk (laughs) towards that towards in the beginning phases when they're you know you don't know what direction they're going to go you know are they going to go up are they going to go to be the next atari there's no way to know and that's where the risk comes in yeah um and so that's where to your point it's not a great long-term investment retirement type strategy Mm -hmm. it's a good fun thing to do um Mm -hmm. with a a, the you know, some money that you don't mind actually losing at some point, you know, that's great. I yeah. we encourage people to do that on a limited basis. You know, there's much worse vices out there that you could spend right. money on right. than trying to pick the, you know, the next Apple. Uh, but certainly within reason and making sure right. you're putting limits on that and you understand how that works and how it plays into the big picture. Well, and, and another thing to keep in mind too is nowadays there are very good ways to invest in sectors. And there weren't necessarily good ways to do that in the you know late 70s, early 80s. But you know, it's one thing to bet on an individual company. It's another to bet on a group of companies that um, you know with a technology that. And it's not that it's still speculative. It's still risky. I don't mean to. Mm-hmm. I don't mean to to downplay that. But you are taking some of that individual company risk out of it. Right. Know? Absolutely. So, um, like there's a lot of exchange traded funds that invest in, you know, new green energy technologies or, yep. you know, solar and, and wind and um, different small slices of the technology mm-hmm. uh, technology sector. So, 
Yeah, um, definitely another way to, to look at getting into an industry without trying to identify the winner. So um, I'll give you one other example that I had uh, earlier on in my career of kind of investing into new industries. And, and this really isn't necessarily an industry at all, but one that our listeners might be um, aware of, and that's Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So um, early on, I actually had a student from MSU who um, I believe was from the UK, and he came in and was asking me about Bitcoin, this Bitcoin digital yep. currency. And I looked at him and I had no clue what he was talking about. He was <laughs> just telling me a story about how someone got a hold of a couple shares and forgot about them. And by the time he got back to them, they were worth like 20 million or something. <laughs> so I was looking at him like, all right. <laughs> Whatever. I'm, not sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure this guy really knows what he's talking about. So I looked into it a little bit more and I actually got to a point once in my life where I was just joking around with my buddies and I was going to buy a Bitcoin. And I think it was like <laughs> $650 for one Bitcoin. I was like, you know, that just seems like a lot. And I don't want to buy like a half a Bitcoin. I don't even know if I mm-hmm. can buy a half. So I ended up not doing it. Well, long story short, um, in the Wall Street Journal the other day, Bitcoin hit fifty thousand. So my my six hundred and fifty dollars would have been worth fifty thousand right now if I had listened to this uh, MSU student. But what I remind myself in that discussion is there is absolutely no way that I would have actually wrote it out to fifty thousand because Bitcoin. Right. I don't want to talk about volatility. They've right. had a lot of it. Um, so, but it's just one of those, you know, those new industry type things where, and there's several cryptocurrencies in there in, in the market now, and I'm not entirely sure what any of them actually do, um, or if anybody actually uses them other than to speculate on the price of them. And so it's one of those, you know, if you could identify the right if Bitcoin or Dogecoin or whatever is the next, or the one that's actually going to hit and land and be useful to people. You could right. potentially make a lot of money, but the chances of you being able to do that, you pr- you're probably better off playing the lottery to some degree. Right, and hope that the federal government doesn't uh, outlaw them as soon as right. they yeah. become, you know, a real... Com- the, the Federal Reserve does not like competition. And, right. you know, it's funny. Uh, once again, we're going to end up sound like uh, stodgy old guys when we talk about this stuff, you know, with no imagination. But to those people, I'd like to point out, you're actually listening to us on a podcast. So how yeah. stodgy and old can we be, right? <laughs> but but uh, on the other hand, yeah, um, you know, and Bitcoin's a good example of the, the like the technology versus the individual investment, too, because, you know, I have no doubt that blockchain as a technology, the technology that underlies Bitcoin is probably going to be much more revolutionary than we even understand right now. Oh, but whether you know whether buying Bitcoin is the right way to to go with that, you know, the jury's still out. We will see. Yeah, so I, I've that that same feeling where Bitcoin seems like it is kind of one of those things that we will come to look back on as we got this great technology from it, but it didn't turn out to be all that useful. And I could be completely wrong about Bitcoin digital currency, but I do agree with you where the underlying technology has a lot more potential, even in our industry, um, mm-hmm. has a lot more potential than maybe what we're seeing in Bitcoin. Right. For cyber technology uses. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next like 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You know, it could be to me that has the most potential to be revolutionary in a way that we haven't seen since the late 70s with the computer industry. And I think we're just now figuring it out. And I know just enough about blockchain to spell it, but probably not enough to explain it any better than that. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we will see where that leads. And, uh, you know, um, the other one that comes up quite often right now with younger uh, clients and folks that we talk to is cannabis stocks. Yeah. Cannabis companies, because that's that's the the fledgling darling of the investment world right now. Yeah, lots of um, lots of companies right now, young industry, young companies making a lot of money. And so I think that grabs a lot of attention as more and more states are opening up the restrictions on cannabis. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of money flooding into that industry. And, and just right. like the computer industry, it's this kind of unknown of, first off, is it going to be legal in the United States at the federal level? Mm-hmm. Um 
And second off, well, how does that play into, you know, which one of these many, many companies are going to be able to take advantage of that right. on the scale of what an Apple or a Amazon or, you know, a company would be able to do in order to take that kind of market share where you would make those kind of returns that we're talking about? Right, right. And, um, you know, we always hate to make predictions, but my guess with that situation is if the uh, legal side of it gets sorted out, all of a sudden you'll see Altria and British Tobacco come in and say, OK, we want to be part of this business now and we're just going to buy this company and that company and the rest of you are just going to all get quashed like like bugs. Yeah. And and, and so you'll end up in a situation where one or two of well one or two maybe a bit of an exaggeration but a handful of these companies thrive not because they exist on their own but because they get scooped up by the big guys that already know how to distribute uh, right. a similar a similar product anyway mm -hmm. and and you know maybe i'm wrong on that but that would be my guess is that uh you're gonna end up with a couple of big players owned by the biggest players and uh the rest will go by the wayside. And that's really the way in any industry evolves. Mm -hmm. You know, um, look at the automobile industry over the last uh, 110 years, 20 years. Look at, uh, you know, we joke that uh, back in 1910, everybody was building a car in their garage the way in, Cal in Detroit and the way in 1975, everybody was building a computer in their garage in uh, Palo Alto in uh, Austin, Texas. So, right. Um, you know, and, and, you know, in the 1920s, there were 30 or 40 different national automobile brands. And, you know, 10 years later, you know, coming out of World War II, there were a handful and they're all owned right. by two companies, three companies. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Pretty, pretty common thing. And I, and I would agree with your sentiment that, you know, I, I would have to think that Altria and, and British Tobacco are kind of licking their chops for this to, to come to fruition so they can legally, <laughs> right. you know, get in and do the playing field and kind of take right. over, if you will. And, and they have the size and scale like we talked about to really and, uh, push the, that uh, industry. Impetus to uh, find something new to do. Right. So, yeah, for sure. So. So, yeah, so we'll see how it plays out. I don't know, uh, uh, you know, there's certainly some excitement and fun when you're talking about industries and particular stocks. But at the end of the day, you know, we've said this a million times already on, on, on this broadcast that, uh, you know, boring is usually the best when it comes to your retirement finances and your uh, long-term outlook. That's right. You know, there's no real shortcuts that make sense. Um, you know, when, when you think about how to, you know, invest and be a long term investor and be successful in the long term way, the boring, methodical, you know, not flashy, not trying to pick the next best thing and get rich quick is usually the way that most people are successful. You're always going to hear stories about the people that have done it the other way and have been very successful doing it. But what you never hear is the, you know, hundreds of people that tried to do it that way and fell flat on their face. Right, right. So um, I think that winds it up for today. Yeah, great topic, fun topic. Yeah, and, and, you know, good. as always, if you have questions on things or, or got an industry that you want our opinion on, certainly reach out to us. We'd love to uh, give you our our. Um, our amateur opinion when it comes to stock picking and <laughs> in industries. Uh, but, you know, we like talking about this stuff. So for, for sure, shoot that out to us. And, you know, if you have questions on how to be boring and methodical, um, you know, we love doing that too. <laughs> yeah, we're good at that. All right. I will uh, talk to you later, Nick. Thanks. Sounds great.